of birth pangs. And it increases in intensity and in frequency, right? And, and yet, when you look at society and you look at the things that are taking place, you see all kinds of symptoms, all kinds of these things taking place. I just want to look at a couple of them this morning. It says in verse 10, and then many will be offended. I have never in my life seen a time in which people were so easily offended and in, offended in mass. We're talking about huge segments of society and they're offended and you can't even tell what they're offended about. And, and, and matter of fact, if, if, you, if you listen to the news, they'll tell you what you should be offended at. I mean, they will. They'll, they'll give you plenty. Of, they'll make a long list for you. You should be offended at this and this and this and this. And, and, and they'll give you your instructions. And that's why I tell you, do not watch the news. I mean, don't do it. I don't care if you're watching CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. None of them. None of them. I mean, yes, Fox News. Because, because it's half truth. It's like what, what uh, Smith Wigglesworth said when he told Dr. Summerall when he's standing on his porch the first time he went to visit and he had a newspaper under his arm. Smith Wigglesworth looked at him. He said, he said what's that under your arm? And he said, that's a newspaper. And he said, get rid of it. I won't allow the half truth in my house. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's half truth. It's, it's got a little bit of truth mixed in with a lie to make it more palatable and easy to swallow. But I have never in my life seen so many people, and it's not just in mass, it's individually too. People are so easily offended. I mean, the things that, that, like Grandma used to say, don't amount to a hill of beans, but people will get offended over it. And it just means absolutely nothing. And it can be real or imaginary, and yet, yet the offense will still remain. Did you know, did you know, there, uh, uh, um, John Bevere has a really good book, and the, the title of it is called The Bait of Satan. Anybody ever read that? So, so in his book, he talks about the, the Greek word that's translated offense there is the word scandalon. And it, it's, it's used, let me, let me read this to you. I'll give you the definition. But it's a, a very, very good book. Scandalon, it's, it's a stick for bait of a trap, generally a snare, a stumbling block, and a fence. I remember when I was a boy, we used to trap. We, we were aspiring trappers. I, re, I remember spending the night with my cousin one time, and his dad, he worked at TVA. He was laid off, and we got up. He was running traps. Then we'd try and catch a, um, muskrat or mink or whatever you catch. Uh, coon, hopefully not possum, but <laughs> sometimes you catch a few of those too. But, but we'd set these steel traps, and I don't know if y'all have ever seen them, but they got the mouths on the steel traps, and then the trigger is right there in the middle, right? And that's what this is talking about. That's the part that springs the trap, scandalon. That's what he's telling us. A fence is what springs the trap and will ensnare you, and this is what the, the adversary is pumping out 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. He's telling you to be offended. He's telling you to be offended at your neighbor. He's telling you to be offended at that person who's a different color than you are. He's telling you to be offended at that person who's a different nationality. Might be the same color, but different nationality. Be offended at them too, because after all, I'm sure they've wronged you somehow, some way. He, he's, he's telling us to be offended, and people are buying into it hook, line, and sinker, and they're being ensnared. He, and and I'm, I tell you, just, just a few of the things that Jesus tells us will be, will be the signs. It's the beginning of sorrows. He said the many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. I have never, again, never in my lifetime seen the hatred that we see in society for, for really for nothing. For nothing. I have never seen like the hatred that people have for the president of the United States. And I'm talking about Christians. Christians, those who, who uh, uh, consider themselves under the name of Jesus, have a hatred for a man that they're supposed to be praying for every day. And I can tell you this from experience. You cannot pray for a person daily and have hatred. You can't, have, you can't pray for a person daily and have ill will for them. So, and, and, and yet we see hatred in our society, and this is in church. We see hatred one for another because after all, they're not thinking like I'm thinking. They're not believing like I'm believing. And, and, and then you have, you know, we have a hatred for people who, and I'm not, I'm in no way, please don't leave here and say, Pastor Chris said it's okay to burn down cities because that's not what I'm saying. But it's not okay to hate the people who are burning things down. It is not. And I was talking about this last week. That, that 
you know, we should prioritize the kingdom. And, and hear me now, because when we fail to prioritize the kingdom, we are complicit in the erosion of morality and the undermining of everything that we hold dear. We're complicit. Because if you're not championing the kingdom of God, if you're not putting him first, then, then everything else, uh, you can't point fingers at somebody else who's not doing what they're supposed to be doing when really you're not either. Because all this stuff will be evidenced in you. We, we had uh, uh, um, Miss Deborah read a, a little piece. She's reading the, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, uh, long-suffering, patience, uh, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And, and, and yet all these things will be evident in you. If you're prioritizing the kingdom, if you're putting him first, you'll see these things increase in people. Because the closer you walk with him, the more pronounced the things of God will be including the vision for your life. If you're, if you're seeking him and pressing into him, everything godly will become more pronounced and the things of the world will dissipate. And the opposite is true as well. If you're in the world and you're not pursuing God, then the things of the world are what's most pronounced. The things of the world, the lies of the adversary become real. And I've told you this before, that a lie has no power unless you believe it. But if you're, if you're dialed into any news outlet, if you're dialed in, if you're on the internet reading all these articles, then, then you're giving ear to that stuff and it becomes more pronounced. And you will, you'll fall prey. You, you'll, you'll press the, the, the trigger in the trap and you'll get offended at people. I, I see it I, almost every day. I see people getting offended. And it's the adversary who's working. And, and ultimately, the offense will take you. It'll carry you over into hatred for another person. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you're just as guilty as a murderer. What do you think about that? If you hate your brother, you're just as guilty as a murderer. And he said... He said, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We see it, folks. We see it. And we see lawlessness abounding. I mean, the insanity of what's taking place in our society, it's all justified because, after all, we're offended. So it's justified. Let's burn it down. Let, let's, it's okay to, to ransack somebody's business and pack off everything they own because I'm offended, right? And that is the definition of lawlessness. It's, it's, it's the, the word translated lawlessness is the same word that's translated iniquity. They just, it's, it's interchangeable. And, and so we see iniquity, we see lawlessness, and it means what it says. It's talking about the word of God, but it carries over into the world. When we're talking about lawlessness, it is deliberate disobedience against what God has said to do or not to do. And this is what we see taking place in society. We, we see, and you look at it like, I mean, never before, I, I remember when I was a boy, and, and you'd see uh, uh, tendencies. You know, you'd see tendencies where, it, you know, they might say, well, it looks like that feller's batting for the other team, if you know what I mean, right? Um, um, he's a little limp-wristed, right? Are you, are you, are you following me? So you'd see tendencies, but, but you wouldn't be told that it's okay. Because after all, back then, it was gender dysphoria. Now, they didn't know the source of the problem, but they knew there was a problem. Do you follow me? But see, now, we don't even recognize that it's a problem. Because there's not a problem with the feller that's batting for the other team. The problem lies with you, right? So we're all supposed to pretend that there's not a problem at all, right? Are, are you following me? So, and, and, and this is, what we're talking about lawlessness, this falls under that definition. And, and it's just like, it's just like, you know, they're, now they're saying that we should uh, um, defund the police. Well, and there's, you say defund, or you can say abolish. You can say, I mean, however you want to couch it, they're talking about the same thing, just get rid of. Can you imagine, I mean, that, that, this is like lawlessness on, you know, it's like, ten, yeah, I mean, steroids doesn't even quite cut, it's like lawlessness, you know, 20.0 or something, you know, not only do we want to break the laws, but we don't want you to, we don't want there to be any consequence either. See, it started with abolish ICE, the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, because, you know, we want to do what we want to do, and we don't want anybody to tell us it's wrong. Doesn't that sound a little bit familiar? But, but see, now we have it ab abolish, ab ab get rid of the police entirely. We, we see all this nonsense and this craziness, and it is lawlessness. But I, I want to tell you, folks, that these are symptoms of, they're symptoms of the disease. It's symptoms. It's, it's like, and I was telling them last service, I remember when, when Lori and I, and y'all going to laugh, 
But when we first got married, and, and we were sitting, and we lived in this apartment, and it was, a, it was an 1800s, early 1800s, uh, stagecoach stop. We had the actual ticket window was in our living room where people, and there was actually a president, yeah, there were presidents that had stayed in this, in this place. It was, it was like a, well, it's a stagecoach stop, but they had rooms for overnighters or whatever. It was in Lithopolis, Ohio. Anybody ever heard of Funk and Wagnalls? Funk and Wagner, that's where they're from, and they had an endowment, had a library that was across the street and down just a little bit. You could, you could see the city of Columbus on the, on the, in the distance over there. But we were sitting there one night, and I got this strange feeling. I said, honey, something's wrong. She said, what is it? And I said, it feels like somebody's choking me. And then I got all concerned. She got all concerned. We got up and went to the emergency room. We sat there in the emergency room for quite a while, and finally they took me back there, and they, they examined me, and they started asking me questions. And then they said, Mr. Wilson, you have a headache. I said, what? They said, yes, you have a headache. It's called a tension headache. I'd never had one before. And Lori, she had this, she had this look. I remember walking out of the hospital. She's like shaking her head. She's half laughing, rolling her eyes and shaking her head. I never, never had this before. But see, the, the, the headache was the symptom of what was taking place. I was stressed and the cure for it was to pray and to get into the presence of God. Do you follow me? So what we're seeing in society is the symptoms of the sickness that is plaguing humanity. It's not, you know, the, the, the fact that pain, pain is not your enemy. Pain only alerts you to the fact that an enemy exists. That's what we fail to understand. So we're, we're all the time rebuking pain, and as well we should, but, but speak to the sickness, curse the sickness, not just the pain. It's like if you have a splinter in your finger, you don't just take an Advil, you try and get the splinter out, right? So the symptoms, and unfortunately in our society, we're very good at treating symptoms. We, you mask the symptoms and just keep on doing everything that you've been doing all along. Just mask the symptoms because I don't want to feel bad. It's okay that the, the disease is still there. Just mask the symptoms. And that's what we're doing as a church too. We're masking the symptoms of the sickness that is plaguing humanity. So what is the sickness? What is it that we're dealing with? It's a heart problem. That's what it is. It's a heart problem. Look in Ezekiel chapter 36. Actually, did I give you Romans 3? Let's keep your finger there in Ezekiel 36. Romans chapter 3 verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. What's righteousness? Anybody remember from last week? Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. His way of doing and being right. Uh, For even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. All, verse 9 says, all are under sin. All are under sin. In chapter 7, verse 13, it tells us that sin was producing, Paul said, sin was producing death in me. And in James chapter 1, it tells us that sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Let me, let me put it like this. In, in later in James, I think it's 2 and 26, it says, For as the body, uh, excuse me, for as uh, the body without spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. We like to, we like to celebrate faith without works is dead, but there's much wisdom and, and, and revelation in the preceding part of the verse when he says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. What happens when you die? Your spirit is separated from your physical body. That's what it is. Your spirit is separated from your physical body. That's when physical death occurs. Spiritual death occurs when your spirit is separated from God who is the life giver. In him is life and his life is the light of men. John, uh, John's gospel chapter 1. He is the life giver. Without him, separated from him, you are dead and death and producing death. Because you're separated from him. That's what it means to, be, to, to uh, be eternally dead, is to be eternally separated from the life. He is the life. And see, the fascinating thing about it is, go back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. Starting with verse 26. 
He said, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. He said, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. He's provided a solution, folks. The problem is a sin-sick humanity, a lost and dying world that's separated from the giver of life. And because it's separated from the giver of life, it does not know what righteousness is. And yet we as a church are called, what, what is it that we're, and, and it says in, uh, uh, first, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, maybe about verse 15, somebody can look that up for me. It says that, what, what is the ministry that we're called to? Anybody know? Ministry of reconciliation. Absolutely. So we are called to a ministry. Matter of fact, uh, it's, in, uh, it's in chapter 7, verse uh, uh, 5, chapter 5, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 17. It says, uh, no, verse 18. Um, um, for, uh, verse 17 says, um, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. For all things, are, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then the very next verse says that we're called to a ministry of reconciliation. And, and see, we're called to reconcile the world to the giver of life. We're called to be the, the, the go-between, the preachers, the proclamation uh, folks, to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. Because without him, I want to tell you folks, there is no hope, no peace, no nothing apart from him. And see, you can't follow a lost and dying world thinking that you're going to have fulfillment and hope because it won't happen. It is impossible to have hope in this world without God. I'm telling you, it is impossible. And yet we're looking at the symptoms of a lost and dying world and we're trying to treat it with the world's, with the world's uh, uh, treatment. We're, we're, we're trying to, to uh, mitigate the symptoms and we're not getting to the heart of the problem, which is the problem of the human heart. And see, the, the thing is, you can't heal this kind of sickness. You can't do it. He says here in Ezekiel 36, you have to have a new heart. You have, to, you have to get rid of the stony heart and get a new heart. And again, in 1 Corinthians 5, it says that you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Behold, old things are passed away. Can I get an amen? amen. So we, we as a people have to pursue, I said this last week, I said it a few minutes ago, if, if we're not prioritizing the kingdom, then we're complicit in what's taking place in society. Because if not me, then who? If not you, then who? Who? You are the only Bible some people will ever read. You are living epistles. And if you're not demonstrating the love of God, the peace of God, the truth of God, if you're not demonstrating for it for them to see, then some people will never see it. Because you have a sphere of influence that nobody else has. You have people that you can reach that nobody else can reach. So it is imperative that we, as a people of God, draw near to him so that he'll draw near to us. See, I wholly believe that we are living in what he referred to here as the, the beginning of sorrows. I think this is we're, the, the day of the Lord is quickly approaching. I, it, never before in history has the time been more right. And, and yet... I also believe that we will see this great end-time revival. If you understand, if you know him, you know his character and his goodness, you know that it's, it's love that motivates everything that he does. Even in the tribulation period, you all know what the tribulation period is, right? Seven years of tribulation, right? It'll start with a signing of a peace treaty. It'll be an agreement between the Antichrist, the lawless one, and the nation of Israel. When that, when that treaty is signed, it starts the Jewish clock ticking again, right? You, I, I don't have time to get into the 490 years, but it'll start the Jewish clock ticking again. He'll break the peace treaty halfway through the covenant. But during the tribulation period, all these things will be happening. There'll be meteors, there'll be earthquakes, the sea will be turned to blood. All these things will be happening. You have the two witnesses in Jerusalem. They'll be, they'll be preaching, and the Bible says the whole world will see them. And then God will protect them and then he'll allow them to be killed. The whole world will witness and they'll throw parties. But, but now I, I tell you, for this reason. And then, then, then the Bible tells us that an angel of God will fly through the heavens preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Everything that he does is motivated by his love. This will also be, it's the, it's the greatest time of tribulation the world has ever known, but it's also the greatest harvest of souls the world will, will ever, has ever known because God is doing things so openly that anybody can look and see that an angel is flying through the heavens and preaching the gospel, and he's doing that because he loves humanity and he wants them to repent. Even tribulation is motivated by the love of God. He does not, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He loves you. He loves the world. While we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. We have to, as a people, we have to repent. He said here, Jesus said that he that endures to the end will be saved. That word translated endures is the same word. It's, it's hupomone. It's the same word that's used in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 36. And I remember this because the Lord woke me up in the night one time. Probably um, Christopher was about three years old. It was shortly before we went to, I preached at a friend's church out in Idaho. And, and he woke me up in the middle of the night and he woke me up three times. And he said, you have need of patience. Let me tell you, if he wakes you up three, he wakes you up once, it gets your attention. If he wakes you up three times, it really gets your attention. He said, you have need of patience. And I thought, well, that's hot. And I went back to sleep. And he woke me up again. I guess I didn't get it the first time. So I know what hupomone means. You have need of patience so that after you have endured, you will obtain the promise, right? And, and, and the word that's translated endure, uh, hupomone, it, it, it says it's a steadfastness, but it's also, it's translated patience in, in Hebrews 10, and some translations also translate it endure, but, but it's talking about a steadfastness, a constancy. A constancy. See, we have to be constant in the kingdom. We have to be consistent in everything that we do always. If you want the same results, see, we want, we want to come in here and, and sing and praise and listen to a, uh, somebody tell me, you know, how wonderful life's supposed to be. And life's supposed to be wonderful in him. Doesn't matter what you, like Mario said, you can be bombarded. But, but if you know he's got you, then you know everything's going to be okay. But, but what I'm telling you is we come in here and we listen to sermons, we sing songs, and then we go back out and we're very inconsistent. We're very inconsistent. It's, it's kind of why, you know, if you, if, you, if you want to get the same results, do the same thing all the time. I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Yes. We need constancy. If we're going to, to uh, um, be saved, then we need constancy. And it's imperative that we do this so that he can use us to reach that lost and dying world that I mentioned. Can I get an amen?